after night, evil stalks a college town in central Florida. He said he was going to rape me all night long and kill me and leave me in the closet for dead. I let the evil in. The evil just took over. If you think of the crimes, we always think of the worst. It's murder, sexual battery, abduction, home invasion. He brought them all together, and he did them night after night. Three years, 675 suspects, 18,000 pieces of evidence. This is the hunt to catch the Gainesville River. We're all down here for just a breath anyway. August 1990. Summer is coming to an end in Gainesville, Florida. School is about to begin. Each fall, thousands of students fill its university and community college. Do this, I got the books over there. It's a time of anticipation. It's a good place. I'm excited like for it. the year. I think it's going to be a good year. Really? Yeah. Phone, Phone over there. Friendly. Of new beginnings. Of independence. Sunday, August 26th. Police get a routine call. A request to check up on two university roommates. The parents of Christina Powell and Sonia Larson have been unable to reach their daughters for days. Christina's car is parked outside, but no one is answering the door of their new apartment. Sonia, Christina, Gainesville Police Department, can you open the door, please? Officer Barber, I have a victim down. I'm gonna need EMS. Send back up. I'm gonna need a patrol supervisor too. CSI Jimmy Ward recalls the scene. First thing I saw was uh, Sonia Larson's body on the the water bed uh, in the third floor uh, bedroom. Sonia, an 18-year-old who wanted to be a nursery school teacher has been stabbed 20 times. Sonia was attacked while she was on the bed, probably asleep. Her arms and hands were extended above her head, which in the smear marks of blood on the bed would indicate that she was pulled down to the uh, foot of the bed. In the downstairs living room, CSIs find Sonia's roommate, Christina, The 17-year-old has been viciously raped before being killed. Her body has been mutilated and pornographically posed. Her nipples are missing, carried away as trophies by the killer. Surveying the carefully staged scene, some fear this is just the beginning of a vicious killing spree. Medical examiner Dr. William Hamilton shares his chilling suspicion. I told investigators that uh, this uh, crime was uh, uh, the work of a Bundy-style serial killer. The only question is how many victims will he take before he leaves Gainesville and goes on to another area. Nine hours after the discovery of the first two victims, cruisers roll again two miles away. 
Krista Hoyt has failed to report for her midnight shift as a clerk at the Alachua County Sheriff's Department. The 18-year-old is studying chemistry and wants to be a crime lab technician. Krista is never late, so alarmed co-workers decide to check her secluded duplex. Oh God, we have a body. Deputy Barber, ACS, need backup right away. We have a body. Krista's naked body is slumped forward on the edge of the bed. And this time, the killer has decapitated his victim. The teenager's head is easy to find. It has been propped on her bookcase for maximum shock value. Senator Rod Smith was state attorney for Alachua County. The crime scenes were terrible. Uh, the killer was somebody who was obviously a histrionic personality, liked to stage and uh, make a production out of the events. And um, when you found them, they were that way. The bodies were posed. They were posed in sexually explicit positions, or they were posed in positions designed to terrify people when they walked into the crime scene. Uh, the, the killer wanted to leave a message uh, with the carnage and the posing. It was all very well staged and and really kind of a production it's clear the violence is escalating where will the killer satisfy his murderous appetite next residents of Gainesville Florida wake up to shocking news Three female college students have been found murdered and mutilated in less than 12 hours. Captain Sadie Darnell was the public information officer for the Gainesville Police. And it was right before the beginning Monday of University of Florida fall classes. And it was uh, shocking to have that in the mix of all the other excitement and the happy times with the beginning of the university. The next morning, the Alachua County Sheriff gets a call about two more students, Manny Taboda and Tracy Paulus. Their friend can't find them. The 23-year-olds are lifelong buddies, the homecoming queen and the football star. Investigators find Tracy's naked body just inside the front door. A trail of gore on a blood-soaked bed the scene screams of terror and torture. You know, when you're going bow hunting, you got to have camouflage. And i tell you something else, too. Aim for the lungs, straight through the rib cage. Either there or the heart, but the best thing to do is hit the lungs, straight through the lungs. Multiple stab wounds show Manny fought to his last breath, trying to save himself and Tracy. His death announces that no one in Gainesville is safe, man or woman. Sonia, Christina, Manny, Tracy, and Krista will not be forgotten by the university community. For a city where the annual homicide rate is usually in the single digits, this crime spree is simply unthinkable. All that coming together in that short space of 72 hours, it just causes a sense of um, it's never going to end. The reality of opening up the door and finding that something really has gone wrong, it's, um, it's frightening. Students flee back to their hometowns. For something to happen so close to home, it makes me afraid. A media throng descends to report their tragedy to every home in the nation. Folks, let's be sensitive to our needs and trying to get, get a hold of them. Let's be sensitive to these families because they're going to be going through absolute hell. The mellow college community is transformed into an armed camp. But then there were the, the people who were desperate to feel safe, and they would go to the gun stores, the pawn shops, and get weapons. Um, all the gun stores at Gainesville and the surrounding area were totally sold out of guns. Fear and rumor spreads. The killer was a pizza delivery man. He wore a police uniform. 
He was a doctor. Each whisper is more outlandish than the one before. For me, to stand up in front of cameras or microphones and tell people to slow down, be calm, you know, do these things to be safe, and in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, oh my God, get out of town. As details of the brutality leak out, the media gives the killer a nickname, the Gainesville Ripper. Evidence at the crime scenes suggests he is a practiced criminal, someone calculated and meticulous. He also has a twisted signature. Each of the women has been left in a lewd position. This was a production. This was a man who wanted to send a message. This was, this was his set. And uh, he was the designer and he was also the director. He clearly was making himself a star. Veteran CSI Steve Platt sees a pattern in the apartment locations. This killer stalks before he slays. The access to the apartments was similar in that he went in through rear doors, sliding glass doors most commonly, and doors that backed up to wooded areas or dark areas where he could uh, perhaps secrete himself and watch his victims before he launched his attack. There's also a particular method to how he stripped his victims. An examination of their clothing, we further knew that it was removed after they were bound because the clothing had either been cut or torn off their bodies. The t-shirts or tank tops worn by each of the victims was cut off using a single cut from the waistline hem to the neckline and then out through the shoulders. On the other hand, the bras worn by the victims were brutally ripped and torn and removal and not cut. You have to imagine the control and the fear that the victims must have felt from seeing that large knife rip away their clothing and then be physically tormented by having clothing torn from their body. The killer washed Christina Powell and Tracy Paulus's bodies before leaving. Prints on Tracy's leg and on a paper towel at the first murder scene confirm he wore gloves to mask his fingerprints. An effort had been made to obscure evidence, to clean up the victims, and perhaps make our job more difficult. The perpetrator obviously had some knowledge of what type of evidence could be used against him. This is a killer who knows what he's doing and possibly how to get away with it. Three days, five dead. The city of Gainesville holds its breath, but no more bodies are found. The killings stop as suddenly as they began. As field teams search for the tiniest clues, a task force of national, state, and local investigators considers the big picture. We were bandying about theories. We talked about the potential. Was it uh, merely a burglary that had gone bad? Or was it a burglar that uh, all of a sudden turned sexual in its attacks? And then why the murder? Uh, why the homicide? And so you, you start looking at pieces of the puzzle and trying to put them together and who was the focus of the attack investigators look for links between the victims all are academic stars at the University of Florida or Santa Fe Community College. But all are in different programs. <laughs> Lieutenant LeGrand Hewitt is the Alachua County Sheriff's lead detective. I think the first impression was, you know, that we had uh, someone that was um, targeting our students and um, someone that had um, put them through a lot of terror, that tortured them mentally, physically and uh, somebody that had a lot of psychological problems. The four women are strikingly similar. Petite, 
with long dark hair. This doesn't look random. This looks like a hunter picking and choosing his prey. The search for connections also focuses on the bodies. Chief Medical Examiner William Hamilton does the post-mortems on all five victims. The number of stab wounds on the bodies varied from one fatal wound you know, on his third victim to 31 wounds on his fourth victim. I think as much violence was perpetrated on each victim as was considered necessary to accomplish the task at hand. Hamilton's analysis of the width, depth, and shape of the cuts suggests the weapon is a marine K-bar. The combat knife is cheap and easy to buy throughout Florida. Seven inches of high carbon steel with a slick-edged bloodline to smooth entry and exit. The K-bar is designed for one purpose only, to kill. The list of similarities between the three crime scenes grows. At each one, sticky residue and gaps in bloodstains on the victim's wrists and ankles indicate where they were bound with duct tape. Pry marks on back doors reveal how the killer got in each time. What's absent from the scenes is as significant as what is found. This was not a panicked killer who struck swiftly and fled. This one took his time. The duct tape used to control the victims has been carefully removed after death. Krista Hoyt's back bears the marks of lividity, discoloration of the skin caused by internal blood pooling after death, revealing that her corpse lay prone for a lengthy period. For veteran CSI Martin Snook, that paints a picture of cold calculation. And yet, we find her in sitting position, so we know that the body has to have been moved several hours after death, and we're trying to determine what would this killer have been doing in this very small one-bedroom apartment for several hours. And uh, we also then uh, proceeded with that and realized based on where the blood was draining from the victim that the decapitation happened after that several hours as well. The volume of evidence in the case is staggering. More than 18,000 items are collected. The investigators that were the primary investigators in this case, they didn't sleep. Uh, they didn't go home. Uh, they never stopped trying. It, it became a mission, and it was a mission uh, that I think law enforcement believed. I've had them tell me that this was the test of their generation, and how they met this test would be how they would be judged and remembered for a long time. One FDLE lab focuses on evidence not visible to the naked eye. Five days after the first bodies are discovered in Gainesville, serologist Jim Pollock goes to work on the case. When our crime scene visited the uh, sites down in Gainesville, there were, there were tremendous amounts of evidence that were collected. Uh, we had no idea what was important and what wasn't. Key evidence comes from Christina Powell's panties and a paper towel found nearby. Both test positive for semen. So does a swab taken from the body of Krista Hoyt. DNA results from the first two murder scenes come quickly. Christina and Krista's rapist is the same man, but who that man is remains a mystery. Hundreds of blood samples must be analyzed. A suspect list grows to 675 names. We decided to create a special investigative squad. We called them the Tubes and Pubes Squad. And their job was to interview or contact each of those 600 names and see if they would voluntarily give us a blood sample 
a hair sample so that they could be excluded from the investigation and therefore save time. One name on the list looks promising. 18-year-old Edward Lewis Humphrey. A student recently evicted from Manny Taboda and Tracy Paulus's apartment complex. Fond of dressing in combat gear, carrying a knife and threatening tenants, Humphrey has a reputation as a violent weirdo. He just had this wild way about him and he just brought attention to himself so when he would go into a donut shop and talk about murdering young women of course hopefully somebody would call in about him and they did bank employee terry mykoff has a close encounter with humphrey around the time of the murders the um humphrey's boy actually had come in to where i was working the one time and when he left the one girl when I, uh we all got together talking and she says, you know, he's just, he told me something that just really, really, you know, bothered me. He says he had knives at home that could flay the skin off my, off my body. And it's like, good Lord. Humphrey is arrested on an unrelated assault charge and jailed. When his bail is set at $1 million, the public assumes the Gainesville Ripper has been caught. Police search Humphrey's new apartment at Hawaiian Village, looking for human flesh, hair, and blood. To FDLE crime scene investigator Alan Miller, the teenager's apartment presents a disturbing picture. There was uh, like a, a, a bright side and a dark side to his apartment. Uh, one side was, uh, was all neat and trim. Uh, things were in their place. The other part of the apartment was uh, grungy. Uh, things were broken and destroyed. Uh, trash strewn about. Obviously, I'm not in the psychiatric field and, and don't want to profess that I know anything about it. But if a person um, does indeed have split personalities like that and lives two different lives within himself, the, the apartment was evident that there was something uh, true to that fact because it was it was really it was strange being in there and thinking that there was two people living in this apartment when in fact only one person did. Despite its odd appearance, Humphrey's apartment provides no murder weapon and no major new evidence. Searchers fan out around Gainesville and beyond. Woods are combed, ponds and streams dragged and probed. Each time, they come up empty. Then three weeks after the murders, the FDLE lab comes back with a critical result. Matching of DNA on evidence from the three crime scenes is complete. All the semen came from the same man, and that man is not Ed Humphrey. Once I knew that the semen was not from Ed Humphrey's, my first thought was, well, the killer is still out there. The task force keeps this development to themselves. Gainesville residents sleep soundly, unaware that their nightmare is still at large. With Ed Humphrey eliminated by DNA, Lieutenant Legrand Hewitt has lost his prime suspect. He goes back to the beginning and reviews all the theories so far. One lead stands out. There is an unsolved triple murder in Shreveport, Louisiana, a full year before the Gainesville killings. The victim and the method of murder are strikingly similar. Julie Grisser, a petite brunette college student, her father, Tom, and her nephew, Sean, were stabbed to death in a suburban home. Julie Grissom was the target, and it was very obvious in that crime scene that she was staged similar to the way our uh, main victims were staged. She was um, stabbed. She had appeared that she had been bound with uh, duct tape. He attempted to um, potentially eliminate... Um, DNA evidence by pouring a fluid on her in hopes to uh, destroy any DNA evidence, the same that he had done in our crime scenes here. Shreveport police think they know who murdered the Grissoms, a drifter named Danny Rowling, who has been on the run ever since. Rowling has led a life of crime. One of his specialties is bank robbery.
Hewitt combs the files for any armed robberies committed in Gainesville around the time of the student murders. He strikes pay dirt with a holdup of the first Union Bank near Krista Hoyt's apartment the morning her body was found. It turns out deputies chased a suspect into the woods that day, but the gunman escaped. Sheriff's Office K-9, anybody in the tent come out now? Hewitt learns that a week after the bank robbery, a grocery store was held up 40 miles from Gainesville. But that time, the robber was caught. He's now in jail, and his name is Danny Rowling. Processing of a secluded campsite provides investigators with numerous clues. Hewitt studies the evidence seized from the robber's forest hideout in Gainesville to see if it could have been Danny Rowling's. Reviewed with the murders in mind, every item speaks with chilling clarity. The campsite revealed numerous pieces of evidence that linked our perpetrator to the campsite and our perpetrator to the crime scene, to the crime scene, to the campsite. A ski mask matches fibers found on a tiny piece of duct tape left behind at the third murder scene. Blood on a pair of Rowling's pants is that of Manny Taboda. One of Krista Hoyt's pubic hairs is found inside Rowling's sleeping bag. The evidence also includes an audio tape of rambling messages and songs. Hewitt hears Danny Rowling's voice for the first time. Without sending this to the three people I love the most, I'll always love you. I love my mother. I love my father. And I love my brother. Now I got the sky for, for a blanket, the earth for a bed, and some rumpled up clothes for a pillow. But it's okay just the way it is. You take the good with the bad. Pretty good at it. Well, I'm gonna sign off for a little bit. That's something I gotta do. Well, we all as investigators knew what that meant. He was gonna go start his crime spree, his murder spree in Gainesville. The task force believes they've found their killer. Now they have to build a case to prove it. A screwdriver found at the campsite is sent to FDLE toolmark expert David Warnament. Warnament knows that every screwdriver leaves a unique imprint. He compares the pattern from this one to markings on the doors at the three apartments. When a tool matches the mark that has been left behind, it's like a combination lock clicking open. In the Rawlings case, when I first saw the identification on the microscope, it, I was very surprised because up to that point, I had no indication that the screwdriver might be involved. A very, uh, not so much elating, but a very surprising uh, feeling that I had. And 
is like this is the screwdriver. As the case builds, Rowling senses the trap closing around him. The FDLE Steve Platt visits him in jail to seize blood and other samples for testing. Uh, we explained to Danny in the presence of his female public defender that we were going to need to collect between 30 and 50 full pubic hairs. And he said, no problem. He stood up from the table, pushed down his jailhouse orange, reached down and grabbed two handfuls of pubic hair and ripped them out in front of his female public defender and said, that ought to be 50. He took deep breaths and puffed out his chest. He rolled his shoulders, stuck out his chin, and became a much more dominant aggressive, mean type personality. He was a true chameleon from meek and mild to big and bad. DNA results come back from the lab. Danny Rowling is the Gainesville Ripper. But in 1990, DNA has been the centerpiece of only a handful of criminal cases. The team is far from confident this unfamiliar science will convince a jury. There were different levels of pressure, and all were enormous. We would be remembered forever as someone that lost the Gainesville student murder cases, and that was, that was a, a, you know, kind of a terrifying specter for me uh, personally. When I was killing her, I felt like power. If the task force can get Danny Rowling to confess to his crimes, it will seal their case. I couldn't stop. Forensic evidence convinces investigators that Danny Rowling killed the five Gainesville students. But the task force wants a confession to close the case. To draw the truth from Rowling, prosecutor Rod Smith tries to get inside the killer's mind. He studies the crimes of Charles Manson, watches the Exorcist movies, and immerses himself in the struggles of man against Satan in Paradise Lost. He really was so Miltonic in terms of his kind of fundamentalist view of, of the forces of evil and, and good fighting on Earth, and it's kind of, it's beyond his control. I knew a little bit about that. I'm, I'm from a rural area myself. I'm from a small country church myself. I knew that Danny was kind of falling back to that and then taking that as a basis for kind of what was a, a very convenient view to him. It was a convenient view in the sense that it, it was a way to remove his responsibility from the bad parts of what he had done. I let my guard down. I let the evil in and the evil just took over. And it was like when the sun would go down, I, I couldn't resist it. It just pulled me like, like a tidal wave. And in the day, when the, when the morning would come up, it was just like I would hate myself. It was like, I, it was like, my God, what have I become? And there was just no turning back. And I think that there's a war going on. And I, and, and, and I think that that war is in a, in a dimension that you can't really see with your naked eye between the forces of good and evil, angels and devils, if you will. And they prey on us. Smith's team learns Rowling has been talking about the murders in prison bragging that he is the superstar of crime. It comes in the dark. Get inside your head. When I was killing the first one, I could smell her blood. Her skin, her soul, so fresh. We got a, um, some information that Danny had written out in his own handwriting what had happened at these crime scenes. And we thought he had hidden them, hidden it in his cell. So we went to Florida State Prison and asked them to do a, a shakedown of that block that he was on and looking for these, um, this letter. We had got information that may be there. Demons are making me do it. Rowling's key confidant is Bobby Lewis, a lifer who is allegedly among Florida convicts. When Danny entered um, Florida State Prison, he learned that Bobby Lewis 
was infamous for his uh, escape off death row, the only person to ever escape off death row. And Danny befriended Bobby in hopes that they could organize a plan to escape off of uh, death row or Alachua County Jail when they got transferred here for trial. The prosecution team believes that an appeal to Danny's ego may prompt him to confess. I thought he had a religious leaning that would require him to confess, to seek some sort of expiation. And I thought he loved to see himself as a star. But I thought that as long as we stayed within the rules and we allowed it to be convenient to Danny to star in this production, to allow things to center on him, to let him tell and vent uh, that he would do so. Uh, Williamsburg homicide. That was the first two. Christine Powell. Legrand Hewitt is assigned to get the confession. He questions Rowling from a carefully prepared script. He committed those uh, homicides the night he moved out of University Inn. But right? Rowling throws up a twist. He will only answer questions through Bobby Lewis. He knows it was afterwards, but he don't know if it was the same night. Right. It's a slow process, but Danny finally owns up to everything. I am now willing to make a statement and answer any questions concerning Gainesville's third murder case and or any other crime which I have participated in. Rowling also admits to killing the Grissom family in Louisiana. There will be no escape for Danny Rowling now. Faced with his confession and thousands of pieces of physical evidence, Rowling pleads guilty on the morning his trial is to begin. What was the sense in it? I knew what the end result was going to be anyway. Save them the trouble of all of that and try to clean the slate. Danny Rowling is sentenced to death. I don't even know how much longer I'm going to be on this earth. But when I die, I hope I'm ready. I hope I die half as bravely as the people who perished at my hand. Because they were brave people. It has taken more than three years to bring the Gainesville Ripper to justice. For the hundreds of investigators and scientists who worked the case, there is finally closure. This definitely by far was the most challenging uh, case to work on. And it was also probably the most satisfying because of the, the, the way that this particular person targeted such innocent people uh, and uh, created such mayhem throughout the entire community. I don't think you can participate in an investigation of this magnitude and size without it having some personal effect on you. And the severity of the crimes, the terrible injustice that these victims have suffered definitely had an effect on me. While I had a great appreciation for the people I'm working for, I also had fear for my, my own family, my wife, and my children. When I was at home, I'd wake up in the middle of the night, check the doors, rattle the windows, make sure everybody was safe and secure. Danny Rowling, to me, was somebody that's basically gutter spit. He made several excuses for what he did, and he made his choice, and he chose to hurt people. He chose to kill them. He chose to take away from families that love these individuals, and he has no excuse for it. What ultimately prevailed in this case was their doggedness, their persistence, their, uh, their unwillingness to give up, to leave anything unattended or unaddressed. The rest of my life, I doubt that I will ever have an opportunity to be part of an endeavor in which people were so selfless. Only one of Rowling's victims will see him die for his crimes. The woman he raped and tormented in the dead of night. He said he was going to rape me all night long and kill me and leave me in the closet for dead.
Serial killer Danny Rowling sits on Florida's death row, awaiting his date with lethal injection for the student murders. Good Lord only knows, man, this time next year I'm liable to be dead. And I can't even argue that it probably wouldn't be a justful thing. But does, does that mean I don't want to live? No, I want to live. But there is another crime for which he has never been called to account. Just two weeks before his Gainesville killing spree, Rowling attacked a woman in her Sarasota home. Janet Frake knows how close she came to being his first Florida corpse. He tried to handcuff me behind me, but the handcuffs wouldn't stay on. So he used duct tape, and he taped my eyes also. Then he ripped off my clothes, and then he proceeded to rape me. Then he took me in the bathroom and raped me again. After that occurred, um, he said he was going to rape me all night long and kill me and leave me in the closet for dead. Remarkably, Frake keeps her cool and diffuses the situation. Treating the masked man like a friend, she talks quietly to him long into the night. The impressions I got of him were that he, he was not all there, that there was something obviously wrong with him, which there is, and how do I make it so he feels I, I feel okay with him. And that's basically what I had to do. She, uh, she, used, her, she used her head and her common sense and, 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 and the way that she, she talked to me and all. It, it, I guess I just I, I felt the connection there, you know. But I wasn't out to kill anybody that night anyway. He even said to me at one point, in any other circumstance, you would literally like to date me. And that made me sick. But I just kept going on with the whole night thinking, I've got to get this man out of my house. Frake, who has read hundreds of true crime books, also applies forensic savvy. She hides a stained towel for police to find and gives her attacker a beer and a glass in the hope that he'll leave a fingerprint. He was a control freak. And I think he thought he was in control, but I was really the one who, was, who took control and, and kind of handled the situation. I'll never know if I am the only victim, living victim. There may have been more before me. Gainesville is forever changed by Danny Rowling's killing spree. Though life goes on in the pretty college town, his bright young victims have never been forgotten. I want forgiveness, but I can't ask them for that. They don't want to hear anything from me. And can you blame them? I can't blame them. I can't blame them for wanting me to, to be dead. Danny Rowling's expressions of remorse ring hollow for those who saw his sick destruction. Danny Rowling enjoyed these murders more than he's ever enjoyed anything in his life, in my view. It allowed him to do what he most liked to do, and that was to control the circumstance, play the role of the star, play the stranger, play the man in the night dressed in, in black who comes into town, kind of a centerpiece of his poetry. Um, it allowed him to control women to his every wish because they had no choice but to try to fulfill his every desire because he completely controlled them. I'm here for five murders. Five people that you know, um, that, you know, that were loved and respected and, uh, you know, that were, that had their whole life in front of them. And so, that's what I'm here for. Danny's sorry he got caught. Um, I think if Danny was released today, it would be no time before he would be violating, uh, ladies again, uh, be raping them and, um, be murdering them again. It would be no time before that happened again. I don't know. It's a question mark. And if there's a question mark there, then that means that perhaps the tendency might still be there. And so, you know, I'm where it should be. The Gainesville Ripper will never walk free. Florida's condemned wait an average of 12 years between sentence and execution. Danny Rowling's time is almost up. <laughs>